Okay, thank you for uh, being part of this community conversation and um, welcome to a lot of folks who are friends and others who are tuning in for the first time. Um, this is a, a great moment um, to be involved in this uh, sector. Um, there is a lot of um, potential and there is a lot of uh, momentum for uh, doing some big things. And as they say, sometimes big, big problems need big solutions. And um, we've never been shy about proposing bold measures um, in our work with the Sierra Club. So um, I'm going to just spend some time talking with you a little bit about the OWL Power proposal for consumer owned utility in Maine. Um, and then, as Matt said, we'll um, have an opportunity for folks to talk about this amongst themselves. And then we'll come back together and um, have some Q&A after we finish that. Um, as you probably know, this is um, a measure that goes back a couple of years. Um, it's had um, a public hearing in the legislature. It's been um, uh, considered in various uh, forms over the last uh, 18 months or two years or so. And um, it has uh, evolved and re been refined somewhat. And it's now at the point where um, it is uh, before or will soon be before the legislature again um, for further consideration in the Energy and Utilities Committee. Um, Seth Barry has been the um, main champion of this measure in the last uh, session of the legislature. Um, and we've also worked very closely with Nicole Grahowski and a large number of other legislators um, who are lending their support and helping to spread the word about this, um, this measure. Um, okay, so. Excuse me for a second while I try to um, coordinate the uh, PowerPoint here. Okay, so some of the I'm having a little bit of a <coughs> slide order in my PowerPoint. It's not what I thought it would be. Um, okay, well, I'll just go with what we got. Um, some of the goals for the state, as everybody um, can anticipate, um, are uh, related to the Climate Council's goals, that the work that's been done in the last couple of years in the previous legislature and, the go and Governor Mills uh, approved um, some aggressive goals for the state of Maine. But we think that with the, uh, our power and the consumer owned utility model, it's realistically to talk about Maine being the first state to reach net zero. Um, and to do it equitably and affordably um, and in a way that stimulates the main, the main economy um, and, and keeps more money within the borders of the state. Um, at the same time, one of our um, major needs of the state is to expand access to broadband. And we think um, that this can also go hand in hand with expanding a consumer owned um, utility model and um, with um, consumer uh, control over more of the infrastructure uh, that can facilitate um, expanded access to broadband around the state um, more quickly and more affordably, um, considering that the infrastructure of the poles and wires um, is common to both, um, both services and there are some uh, potential economies there and, and, and opportunities to facilitate and accelerate expansion. So this pathway obviously involves um, replacing the investor-owned for-profit um, central main power and versant utilities with a lower cost alternative that would be controlled by folks here in Maine and with a focus on reliability economy and achieving those, those uh, other goals that we just mentioned. And um, in the legislation that's going to be coming forward, this will be called Pine Tree Power Company. And um, as, as noted, it will be a nonprofit uh, corporation, a utility that will be operated just like other nonprofit utilities around the country and in Maine. We see right here in this map um, the service territories of CMP in blue and Amera in green. Um, the rest of the state is actually already um, served by other consumer owned or municipal utilities. 
Um, but uh, Pine Tree Power Company would take over the service for the areas outlined in blue and green, um, which is uh, over 90, 90, 95% of the state in terms of the numbers of customers. Um, in this legend down below, you can see um, the other uh, about a, almost a dozen um, uh, consumer owned utilities around the state, um, including um, some in the islands the off the shore. Five pumps is what caused the evacuation of those. Yeah, that's correct, sir. Sorry. Um, and um, the Holton Water District um, and um, uh, some others, Kennebunk Light and Power, Madison Electric Works, which uh, some of you are probably uh, familiar with. Um, for those who don't know a whole lot about how the grid, the grid is organized, this uh, slide is a sort of schematic of what part of the grid Pine Tree Power Company would own and operate. Um, on the left here is the generating um, assets, the, the wind power in this example. Um, and on the right is the ultimate consumer, your home or small business or even industrial consumer. And in between are the poles, the wires, the transformers, the hardware that brings the power from generators to the home. That's the sector of the grid that the Pine Tree Power Company would own. Um, as we uh, refer to it, it's the transmission and distribution sector of the, of the grid. Um, right now, um, there are a lot of examples and precedents for uh, consumer-owned uh, electricity in the United States. Um, one out of three American consumers gets their energy from consumer owned utilities. Um, it surprises some people because, um, you know, in Maine, it's uh, predominantly an investor owned utility model. Uh, but in other states, um, like Nebraska, is entirely owned um, by consumer owned utilities. And other, other states have large municipal utilities, and other sectors of, their, of the states are owned and um, controlled by consumer, the consumer owned model. Um, the Rural Electrification Administration, part of the New Deal in the 1930s, helped to facilitate a lot of this. So what are the benefits of a consumer-owned utility? Well, we, they come in three general categories, um, reduced cost, um, local control, and um, enhanced reliability. In terms of cost, um, the, the uh, empirical information shows that um, about 13% lower costs are paid for consumer-owned utilities than for less uh, uh, investor-owned utilities, um, particularly in Maine. Even um, even with some of the more expensive um, uh, locations, such as on the islands, where it's it's more expensive to deliver um, uh, electric power than it is on, on the mainland. Uh, taken together, the, the cost is still lower than it is for the investor-owned utilities in the in the state. And this chart to the right shows the uh, a projected savings over the next 30 years of $9 billion uh, from the uh, consumer-owned model over the investor-owned um, uh, approach that we are currently uh, using. Um, and this is a, a result of um, savings that are going to be leveraged during the investment that's going to uh, take place in order to achieve beneficial electrification. In other words, to build out those poles, wires, hardware, transformers, et cetera, that will help us to move um, transportation and heating uh, services onto the grid um, where they will be uh, ultimately powered by cleaner sources of, of power. Um, Local, the local uh, control aspect of consumer owned utilities. Um, first of all, um, there will be an independent board within the state that will take control and run um, the operations of the utility. Um, that uh, will replace uh, the uh, boards that are uh, currently um, not really based in Maine for the incumbent investor owned utilities. And um, some, in some cases, not even based in, in the country. Um, but a local consumer owned and control, controlling board will make decisions um, that um, will determine you know, the future and, and the rollout of this, um, of this approach. Um, the uh, money that's, that you pay as a ratepayer um, will stay in Maine. Um, it will not go to um, pay off an investor uh, out of state. Um, and uh, by uh, leveraging lower cost financing, 
Um, we think that the consumer owned utility creates the opportunity uh, to achieve beneficial electrification more rapidly um, and more deeply um, than an investor owned model at the same cost. And therefore it'll create more jobs. It'll stimulate the economy and bring with it the attendant multiplier effect. Um, that'll be good. It'll be good for all sectors in the state, not just the utility sector. Um, reliability, um, you know, Maine has uh, currently some serious uh, problems with reliability uh, of our electric grid. And that affects um, you and me when we're working from our homes or we're just doing our day-to-day, -day, um, uh, uh, conducting our day-to-day -day business um, in a small business. Uh, it also impacts uh, in industrial consumers and uh, other large um, uh, customers of the utilities. Um, and it hinders our economic development when um, a, a, an industry knows that it cannot get reliable power, it may think twice about locating the main and we may suffer the economic consequences of those jobs that um, were not brought here. So um, we also think that um, investing um, in the uh, poles and wires um, uh, rather than um, diverting um, profits to overseas investors will help to improve resilience of the grid um, and help to uh, ensure that you know, our frequent outages are reduced significantly uh, whether it's from an ice storm or from uh, some other unexplained occurrence. Okay, so how do we achieve this? Well, there is, as noted, um, there, are, there are many precedents for consumer-owned utilities around the country, and there are even precedents for um, specific uh, municipalities to um, transition from investor ownership to consumer ownership. But I um, have a sort of rhetorical question here. What do all of these six cities you see on your screen have in common um, from Alaska to Kansas, Texas, Colorado, Vermont, Missouri? Um, what do they have in common? All six of these municipalities have two things in common. One is they're all um, completely powered by 100% renewable energy. And the second is that they're all consumer owned. They all have consumer ownership of their electric utilities. And we just don't think it's a coincidence that the first municipalities to reach that 100% renewable benchmark um, are in the consumer ownership category rather than the investor ownership category. Um, as a lot of you know, um, our energy grid is on the brink of an of a unprecedented transformation. Um, it's been um, you know, inadequate to meet the goals, uh, the needs of our, of our state um, to date, as we know from the many outages that have occurred. Um, and it's going to be stressed and challenged even further as we move towards the beneficial electrification necessary to achieve our climate goals. Um, we're gonna be carrying three times as much power over the electric grid. And those wires you see overhead cannot carry an unlimited amount of power. Um, they need to be upgraded and supplemented in order to achieve the grid of the future, to, in order to carry all of that power that's going to be needed for beneficial electrification. So we think that um, this is, this is the, the core, the, the, the um, secret and the um, only uh, pathway to our energy future is to achieve beneficial electrification. And that necessitates um, some real careful thinking about the grid itself um, how we manage it and how we pay for that expansion. As we noted, um, we think Maine can be the first state to net zero in our electric grid. Um, and we think that in doing so, we will um, stimulate the economy and um, also achieve our climate goals and keep more money within the state. Um, you see here a residential solar panel installer. Um, these are terrific jobs in the state. Um, and um, obviously they're jobs that, um, that keep investments uh, in the state and that keep money uh, churning through the local economy. Um, we can um, uh, you know, support local small businesses and not so small businesses that are emerging in the um, solar installation, but not just in that area, in other 
um, other uh, sectors that are going to be contributing to this beneficial electrification trend, um, not just uh, the renewables themselves, but uh, the grid the hardware that uh, goes along with that, um, that's going to be needed to carry that power around the state. Um, Maine uh, could do a lot better um, in terms of broadband access. Um, 85,000 Maine uh, homes um, do not have um, uh, adequate broadband access. And in, in the time of um, homeschooling and working from home, this has been a serious uh, setback. It's a serious problem for the state. Um, and we are incorporating um, the goal of expanded broadband access into our, our power proposal, uh, into the legislation. And um, we think this is a common sense measure where um, the polls can be commonly owned between um, uh, uh, an investor owned utility that can um, actually run the wires for power and run the wires for um, broadband on the same poles at a lower cost than the current pole attachment fees, which make up a large part of the cost of expanding broadband around the state to all uh, commercial and uh, residential customers. Okay. Okay, um, here's um, a couple of examples of municipalities um, in the country that have made the transition. Um, Winter Park, Florida in 2005 made the transition. Um, there was a public vote that was strongly supportive of moving towards consumer ownership. This was resulted um, from something not unlike Maine, where there were great um, problems in Winter Park with uh, outages, a lot of them related to their um, hurricanes, rather, of course, rather than ice storms, but um, still the, a feeling that there was not enough investment in hardening and resiliency of the local grid. Um, they were able to pay back the acquisition cost in under 10 years. And as a result, statistics down in Winter Park show that they've had much greater re reliability, um, even as storms have gotten larger and more in intense over the years due to climate change. Uh, Jefferson County, uh, Washington is another example of a, um, an effort to take a, a utility to a consumer ownership model. Um, they succeeded in reducing rates um, and um, bringing benefits to low-income households in particular, um, and also were able to meet uh, local job creation goals and to uh, contribute to their um, uh, climate goals by decarbonizing the energy sector as well. Pittsburgh is another model. Um, this is a large city. They, they were um, notable because of their um, innovative uh, community advisory councils that they rely on for direct input from the public into decision making of their utilities. Um, and they also have, have established a good track record of investment in green infrastructure um, using lower cost municipal bonds to leverage the capital rather than paying you know, twice as much for investor uh, owned um, equity through um, a stock market kind of um, uh, model. Chattanooga, Tennessee um, has done a terrific job, especially with broadband. Um, uh, they've now become a model for um, access to broadband around a municipality. Um, this has been going on there for about 10 years now, and um, they were able to leverage their existing uh, poles and wires from the public utility company in order to um, increase improve access throughout the entire city um, at an affordable rate, again, with a special emphasis on reaching low income households and, and giving them the benefit of the economic um, opportunity that comes with expanded access to broadband. So there are um, certainly uh, there's no blueprint for how to do this. Um, the acquisition process is not something that, um, you know, we can uh, just, uh, uh, you know, turn a page and um, move into consumer, consumer ownership, but it is certainly something that has been vetted and reviewed for legality by 
experts, including um, people who testified at the Energy Utilities Committee last year that um, this can be done and there are no legal impediments to it. Um, but the process needs to be done thoughtfully and needs to be done over a little bit of time um, to allow uh, a new board to be put in place and to allow the assets of the outgoing utilities to be procured and a system of management of those assets to be, to be put in place. Um, so Pine Tree Power, um, which is not the state itself, um, under the legislation that's now um, in the works, uh, Pine Tree Power would buy the assets of Versant and Central Maine Power um, and would pay a fair price for them. And there would be a process where a what is a fair price would be determined by um, you know, looking deeply into the value of the assets and against the standards of what is fair uh, in the industry and then having that approved if necessary, approved through a judicial process. One of the secrets of consumer owned um, the benefits of consumer owned power is how it can access capital. Um, the grid of the past hundred years and our whole electric system of the past hundred years has largely been, um, uh, the cost of it has been driven by fuel costs. Um, and to oversimplify somewhat uh, in the future with all of the technology that's involved in renewable energy, distributed generation, um, microgrids and the uh, beneficial electrification we've been talking about, um, the, the, the cost driver for our electric system will be the cost of capital, will be cost of making all of those physical investments, the one-time upfront cost that has to be paid in order to put batteries in place, in order to put uh, new substations in place, in order to build, build out our wiring infrastructure, whatever it is, the cost of capital will be the cost driver um, as we triple the size of what our electric grid can carry. Um, so we really have to look closely at making sure we're getting the lowest cost capital in order to move forward as uh, rapidly and as deeply as possible. Um, Pine Tree Power will use low interest revenue bonds, um, which are um, at, a, you know, at a two to 3% um, charge for borrowing uh, an, a large amount of money needed to build this infrastructure. Um, they will not be paying investors an investor premium um, for um, the stock that is sold uh, to those equity investors, such as the current in, um, incumbent utilities ha have to do. Um, this does not depend on state taxes. It does not depend on the state ownership or the state guarantee of these, of these uh, bonds. Um, these are uh, revenue bonds that are um, secured by the um, uh, collection of bill, bill payments from, from customers. Um, and that's a very stable and low cost way to fund this kind of infrastructure. It's important um, to um, value the workers who uh, provide um, the physical um, labor and expertise to um, uh, enable our grid infrastructure to serve us. Um, current workers under the proposal that's before the legislature will be able to keep their jobs and their contracts and their seniority. Um, we expect that the new utility will, um, will prioritize highly qualified professionals um, and that uh, to, to achieve that uh, grid build out that we've been talking about, we'll bring on new workers to, to support those goals. Um, so this is something that, um, you know, the people who are um, actually out there in the trucks and in the offices to deliver the services will be valued and will be appreciated by this locally owned um, um, uh, nonprofit. So that's my um, presentation and um, we hope you will um, connect with us and uh, learn more about it. And I'm um, certainly happy to have some conversation, but I believe if I'm not mistaken, Matt, the next step here is to do some breakout rooms and um, then come back for Q and A after that. Yeah, well, um, yeah, we encourage you all to participate if you can in some small breakouts just for a few minutes uh, we do have a prompt. I'll share my screen and then um, we can come back and answer as many questions as possible. Um, so the prompt is 
what is the main benefit of a consumer owned utility and what are the main challenges of implementing? John laid out um, most of those, but it would be great just to foster some dialogue, meet, meet a neighbor, and um, we'll circle back in a couple minutes and then we can answer all those questions. So uh, I'm just gonna go for it and we'll, we'll see you back here in five minutes. everyone. I'm going to continue recording. Um, I hope that was, hope that was helpful. I know, you know, sometimes it's hard to chat with others in a presentation like this, but hopefully it was valuable. Um, and at least kind of creating the questions to ask. I know I was in a group and I bet you, you all had some similar themed questions. Um, we're going to try to try to keep them in the chat for the moment, just because we do have a slightly larger group. Um, but John, yeah, I mean, I guess we could start with the one in the chat that I heard a few times, which was, I think, it, uh, about the citizen initiative and um, how that relates to this legislation. I also heard, obviously, a question about that, more about the acquisition and um, how the board is made up. So I assume you heard similar questions as well. Yeah. So. Um... Those are good questions. I guess I'll start out with the citizen initiative question. Um, I think the uh, uh, folks know that um, you know we have um, a lot of different ways to move forward with a piece of policy like this. The legislature itself um, could enact a bill or it could be taken out to the voters after gathering signatures like just you know yesterday we learned that the uh, folks opposing the corridor have succeeded in, in gaining enough signatures to put their measure on the ballot. Um, so each year there's a deadline in January for submitting your signatures. Um, so the, the deadline for 2021 obviously is behind us and there'll be another deadline in 2022. Um, and at that time, it's possible that, you know, if the legislature hasn't enacted um, um, a bill of this nature, then um, a, a measure could be uh, put before the legislature and then go out to the ballot in 2022 or even some later time. Um, and then it's also possible that the legislature itself could send a measure directly out to the voters without going through the signature collection process. Um, so there are a couple of different pathways to, to, um, to move on. Um, but let me just say that this is the kind of a question about um, a very um, important piece of our economy um, and a public good that um, serves us all um, and that um, you know, relates very much to the kind of state we wanna be and um, who we want to be in the driver's seat. And these kinds of big questions are, are you know, the kind of things that citizen initiatives um, are made for, for people to weigh in and, and say, yeah, this is really, really important to us to achieve our climate goals, to do it affordably, um, and to be ha you know, in the driver's seat to have local control. And that's the kind of thing the voters should weigh in on. There's many people who feel that way. Um, so I can't say from where we are right now, what's gonna happen. Right now, the, most of the um, energy and the attention is on the legislative piece because we expect to be public hearings there before, before too long. Um, in terms of the control of the uh, board, I mean, the legislation creates a board that would be an ele elected board um, with uh, some members um, elected representing um, different um, geographic areas of the state. And um, some members would be uh, non-voting board members who'd be ex experts in the area. Um, who would be appointed but not elected. So it's a, it's a blend of expertise from non-voting members with the you know, democratically chosen elected members 
Um, and um, that's a, uh, a feature that is uh, common with some uh, municipal uh, utilities around the, around the country uh, that have um, locally elected um, uh, members uh, controlling uh, a municipal's um, electric and you know perhaps water supply system. People in Portland are familiar with voting for the Portland Water District board members, for example. Um, so what other, what was the other question? Uh, at least from my group, and I don't know about others. Feel free to put in the chat. Was um, just about how to require or the sale, um, the acquisition, and the companies how that the mechanism might work or can you compel them to do that? Um, and then I guess right before that, there was a question of the appointments of the board by whom? Yeah. Um, so the, um, yes, you can compel them to sell. Um, there are, are different sort of legal pieces of that. Um, but uh, the short answer is that yes, you can. And as I, as I noted, one of the um, experts who testified to the um, committee of jurisdiction last year um, was an attorney who was uh, one of the national experts on this kind of thing. And um, he gave in-depth testimony after reviewing the whole uh, question and reviewing the legislation that, that as it stood at that time. And um, he testified that there really is no legal impediment to doing this. Um, uh, the, the question comes down to the valuation of the utility and the assets that would be procured and what exactly is the price tag that's to be put on that. Um, and that's not something that um, is um, you know, easy to answer because uh, there are a lot of market forces that affect what the real valuation of all of that, the poles and wires are and the, the package of it all together. What is, what is, how do you evaluate that? And that's a fair question that is not you know, easy to answer, but would have to be answered in the course of, of making this kind of transit transition. Um, there would have to be a fair compensation to the utilities for those assets. Okay. Um, I see a question here. We wondered if we could also own the power generation too. Um, in Maine, um, the law currently says that um, a utility um, such as central main power or Versant cannot own power generating assets. Um, that is uh, a result of the deregulation of the generating side of the utility world um, around 20 years ago, where um, the utilities were uh, required to divest from their assets, their generating assets. Um, and that is because um, the argument was made that the generating side is um, there's no need to have you know, a regulated monopoly, that there can be competition and that competition would be good uh, for prices and good for consumers as different um, uh, generators uh, try to get a larger share of the, of the market. Um, so right now, basically there is no option for a um, utility to own the generating apps, assets and that's not part of this plan. Although I do believe there is legislation that is separately going forward that will be looking at that issue and uh, looking at whether um, the advantages of low cost financing that I described earlier might also apply uh, to financing the purchase and acquisition of generating assets. All right, good question. Yeah, and there's um, another one in there, John. I don't know if you see that, but... Um... Well, I see something about the utility changing ownership in Eastern Maine. Um, I would just note that um, kind of interestingly, uh, some of the um, critics or opponents of uh, consumer owned utilities uh, try to try to frame it as a question of a government ownership, government control of a private sector uh, industry. And it's it just, you know, for the record, interesting to point out that the uh, Versant um, uh, utility is um, a wholly owned entity affiliated with the city of Calgary. So basically, uh, the city of Calgary is the is currently uh, a government, of course, and an owner of the Versant utility. Um, and uh, the difference is that any uh, profits or excess payments that are paid um, to Versant, um, instead of staying in Maine, they go to provide a rebate to the uh, consumers or the taxpayers of, of Calgary. Um, so I, I think once people start thinking about that and realize 
that it doesn't have to be that way um, and that we could keep that money here in the state, um, they tend to look um, um, more favorably towards uh, what we're trying to do here. And um, all right, there's a few more popping in here, but before we kind of stay on that, there's just a question about, you know, tactics around um, combining this with fighting the corridor or not. Um, it seems like they're separate. Um, we're all kind of, or some of us are working on both of them at the same time, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, they're kind of on, um, I think they're both born out of out of a frustration um, that's you know feels very similar. The frustration with um, people who feel like they were not consulted and um, the process of creating the corridor, um, or feel like it just goes against the interests of Maine and and benefits the interests of people outside the state. Um, there's a lot of that that I, I sense from the uh, corridor opponents, um, and there's you know sort of a, a sense of um, you know, powerful interest abusing their power, frankly. And um, that kind of resonates with the people who are looking at the consumer ownership idea. Um, there are certainly people um, who, you know, don't oppose the corridor, who do support computer consumer ownership and maybe vice versa. It's not complete overlap, um, but they're both, neither one is really very surprising um, in a state like Maine where people are very sensitive to issues like local control and um, the preservation of um, you know, our, um, our values as a state and our mission for you know, clean energy and so on. Um, it's not a surprise that there would be a lot of overlap between the two, the two efforts, uh, but the timing is different. The consumer ownership issue is going out. Um, if it goes out to a ballot question, it would go out sometime in the future and, and the corridor uh, question looks like it's headed for the ballot this year. Okay, great. And um, yeah, there's another question about the generation piece. It seems like it's more maybe related to um, upcoming legislation or maybe even legislation we've had that needs to be implemented um, to cut down on the needs of larger electricity losing grids. Uh, do you know of bills coming up or are we still in the implementation phase of last session of some of those bills? Um, there are a lot of bills coming up and I don't really uh, profess to be an expert on all of the different proposals out there. And there's been a lot of good work, a lot of good thinking about the whole, um, you know, the direction that we need to go in. But let me just say two, two things. Um, one is that um, grid um, planning um, is um, critically important. Um, and it, it's important in a democratic sense that the, that the public should be able to have a say in, in how we build out our grid. It should not just be left um, to market forces. Um, and then the second thing I would say is that um, no matter what happens, um, our grid is, in, is poised for enormous transformation. It's just not going to be, you know, like for years we had, um, you know, Maine Yankee uh, pumping out power and and directing it, you know, around the state through large um, power lines and distribution system. Um, and then, you know, of course, there are more than just Maine Yankee, but in general, the paradigm was, you know, a few large generators um, spreading out the power across the state over wires to a lot of individual consumers. That whole paradigm is um, going to be lost. Uh, the, the new paradigm is distributed generation sources all around the state, um, batteries, um, solar, wind, um, other kinds of um, renewable and green energy sources uh, distributed in different, multiple different locations around the state. And that creates a very different kind of an electric grid. It still needs the wires and the poles to carry power, but it's not all one direction from one central location spreading all around the state. It's more, you know, needs to be balanced. It always, it, you, with the grid, you, you always have to have the same amount of energy going into it as comes out of it, or else you start to have um, mechanical and technical problems. Um, so it has to always be kept balanced and each part of it has to be kept balanced, which is a challenge, a technical challenge. And that's the, that's the challenge of the future of grid. Um, and that's, that's the new paradigm that we'll be dealing with instead of that old centralized paradigm of the past. Great. 
yeah, um, that was that was very helpful. I see a question maybe priming us for action a little bit. Um, where is this bill in the legislature? Um, I mean, is, is it similar to the one introduced last session? Yeah, um, we don't. We haven't seen the bill yet, um, so we expect it'll be coming out any time now. There's a there's a backlog of the people who, who write the bills and, and create them and print them up so that they can be circulated and have a public hearing. There's a, there's a backlog and that just takes them a while to uh, churn through uh, almost 2000 bill requests this year. So I expect that it could be available anytime, certainly this month, and then a public hearing will be, you know, at least, uh, you know, two weeks after that, um, maybe sometime in, in March or April could be a public hearing. And then the work sessions in the in the committee. So um, that's kind of the, in general the, the timeline that we envision. Um, so it, it will be likely be um, different from the bill last session, the LD 1646. Um, it definitely has um, gone through some some changes, some improvements, and some elaborations and clarifications. And we've learned from some of the um, you know. Uh, conversations that were held uh, over over the course of the last 18 months. All right, yeah, and we'll we'll definitely um, I know our our power, I'm sure we'll uh, keep people up to date. We'll also keep people up to date and I shared it in the beginning, but I'll share um, our campaign to keep you informed and help help you take action um, over these weeks and months. Bills can be introduced very quickly at this point and a hearing pops up. So um, I encourage you to log on there and you can help, you can stay informed. Um, if I don't see any other final questions here, um, but feel free also to reach out to me or John. Um, I'll just put my email in the chat as well. Well, while we're while we're yeah. here, I will just I see a, a comment in the in the chat about Texas, and um, the comment was the fossil fuel um, uh, folks tr blamed um, renewables for the um, tragedies down there that were from the devastating um, power outages and 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 winter winter conditions, um, and that is of course true. Um, um, another lesson to learn from that though is that. Um, resiliency is just so critically important and um, a consumer owned utility can, um, we believe, direct more resources into grid resiliency um, to protect us and to protect our, our access to electricity in a time of a, of a crisis like that um, and uh, not, not shave off that extra money and send it uh, out of the state to investors. Yeah. All right. Any other uh, final? So, questions? just encourage folks to stay stay involved with the Sierra Club uh, chapter, and um, you can contact our power directly for uh, more opportunities to learn about this and to, um, you know, uh, help educate the public and help educate uh, decision makers on this. Great. Thank you, John, very much for your time. This is very informative. I'm glad to see such a big group and um, I know I learned something. So um, let me just quickly, where did it go? Uh, we do have an, another upcoming community conversation. We always appreciate you all coming to these. Um, the next one is on a climate to thrive on March 2nd at noon. Um, all these events are on our homepage, sierraclub.org slash main on the front calendar, and um, we'll keep you updated. We'll, we'll send uh, any links to you after this meeting as well, and this will be up on our YouTube and our website. Um, so 